Hello, everybody. This is the Chocolate News Podcast. I'm your co-host, John Alexander Reese. And I'm your co-host, Andrea Carter. And if you did not know, the Cincinnati Herald has been around since 1955 and is the leading African-American-owned newspaper in the greater Cincinnati area and northern Kentucky area. How's it going, Andrea? It's going fine. I, I, I almost had a little teeny tiny hope of a white Christmas for a hot second. And then after the snow squall ended, I was like, oh, okay, next year. (laughs) 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 We had a little taste of winter on Monday, just a little taste, a little hint, a little few snow squalls, light flurries, the grass turned white for a hint of a second. And then that was it. So, um, (laughs) you know, we, we, we had our taste of Christmas joy, at least snow wise, and then it's going to warm up and it's going to be rain instead. So pray that it doesn't flood. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and we also have a special guest with us today. We have Antoinette Moore. How's it going, uh, Antoinette? It's going pretty good. Thank you, John. Yeah, no problem. Now, before we move on to our special guest, we have some chocolate news to discuss. So, Andrea, what is the chocolate news of the week? Well, the chocolate news of the week, we start off with a little sad note. Um, Coney Island is closing after 125 years of business. That's a long it time. Just, it's a long time. And it, it wounds me that it's it's shutting down. Um, you know, where, where are folks going to go? You know, that's a huge pool out there that folks enjoy during the summertime, you know, um, I don't know where everyone's going to go for swimming now, but... um, Uh, I mean, I guess Kings Island. (laughs) Oh, that's true. That is true. Kings Island is a little further out in the opposite direction, but... I'm not not trying to plug Kings Island or anything. You know, we got two, (laughs) we got two pools, you know, and they're, you know, waving and stuff. So just, just, just food for thought. Yeah, it's food for thought. But I mean, basically there's a sense of history. Um, Coney Island, um, if you think about it, was opened... Um, in 1886, the wow. Sunlight Pool opened in 1925. And if you think about it, you know, they didn't allow Black people to swim in Sunlight Pool. There they was did one not. Special, and there was only one day that they could swim at Sunlight Pool. And um, Marion Spencer, the late Marion Spencer, fought to integrate Coney Island That was our own moment of civil rights movement here in Cincinnati um, to integrate Coney Island. And, you know, once they fought to open those gates up and allow Black children to be in that pool, here we are. It's now going to close. And um, unfortunately, just a little bit of our history is going away. But the um, Cincinnati Symphony that owns the Music and Event Management Incorporated Company they plan, they say that this is going to be, what's going to be built there instead is going to be state-of-the-art, up-to-date technology, entertainment complex that we will all enjoy and love. And, I, and I'm sure Riverbend needs a little updating. The outdoor amphitheater out there needs some updating. Oh, with, yes. You know, music, lights, maybe the seats need to be replaced. So, yes. you know, just, just hold that whole um because you know there have been some good concerts out at river band so oh yeah i've had the pleasure of both sitting in the grassy section and in the seat section so you know and the sound system alone is fantastic but it's gonna be interesting to see what they do with the rest of the complex and see what happens so i'm interested to see what they what they do next i'm sad to see it go a little bit of history but you know as they say life moves on unfortunately yeah, but we'll all, but we'll but we will remember Coney Island for what it stood for, and you know we all had a great time there. A number of events were held there, um, so everyone has a little bit of Coney Island history that they can remember. I got to see my favorite country music artist Darius Rucker. So, oh really? Okay. Oh, I'm a very quiet country music fan when it mm. comes to Darius Rucker, Hootie and the Blowfish. And let me uh, tell you, when he sings that I'm a country boy, oh my God, he is <laughs> such a country boy. Oh my God. But anyway, <laughs> moving on. Just a side note real quick. Uh, I'm looking forward to the Bengals game against the Steelers on Saturday. Oh, yeah. um, 
the odd if you're looking to bet on the game not trying to encourage anybody but the odds right now are favoring the Bengals over the Steelers believe it or not usually it's the other way around hmm. um but the Steelers have not been doing very well they lost in the last game um right now the Bengals are ranked six in the AFC North where the Steelers are now ranked 11th instead of ranked fifth uh, which I think is it's not supposed to go the other you're not supposed to slide back you're supposed to move forward so it's going to be interesting to see both sides have um, um, have record injuries on both sides. So it's going to be interesting to see who they bring out to replace the injured teammates and see what the mentality is going to be on Saturday for um, the Bengals against the Steelers. The Steelers do play dirty, especially when they have injured people. They play dirty. Mm -hmm. um they they you know basically they're out of the wild card playoff even if they do win they're still out um i think for us it's to hold our position and win and do good so we'll see if the magic continues so yeah, that's that, the Bengals. yeah that'd be nice it really would it really would um and then another sad note it just it just wounds me marvel actor Jonathan Majors has been found guilty in third degree and guilty of harassment, third degree of assault and, and guilty of harassment, which is kind of sad. You know, the, the Marvel folks fired him. Um, they did, you know, the jury deliberated four hours um, to come to this decision. He is set to be sentenced February 6th. Um, I think... Um, I, I I I question why you know all this what went down because yeah he shouldn't have touched her but at the same she shouldn't have touched him and and I think it's unfair that when he was trying to get away from her she went after him and assaulted him but she's not facing charges and that's what I'm hearing more about from especially black women that why isn't she facing charges then he's facing charges. So there's that. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens next. Yeah. Um, he can get up to a one-year prison sentence. It's a misdemeanor. We'll see what happens. Um, well, 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 you know what? It's like, I, I don't think the judge will sentence him. I mean, he could or he or she could, but I don't think so. I just think maybe probation and maybe community service because, you know, it's like compared to like what other people did well I'm, I'm not i'm not ignoring you know what happened but i'm just saying it's just like it, it seems like it was a toxic relationship and i just feel like his career shouldn't be thrown away just because of this incident i yeah, I, a, I, I i i don't know it's, it's it's unfortunate situation um hopefully he'll be a better judge of character yeah going forward but I mean, again, everything that was revealed during the trial, he wasn't the only one at fault in this. She was at fault too. And he should have had a better control of himself. Oh yeah, most definitely. And, you know, but she should have had a better control of herself as well. Yeah. It's unfortunate. You, you never want to see a black man sentenced yeah. or found guilty of anything but at the same time, if they did wrong, they need to face the punishment. But I think she should face punishment as well because it was both sides yeah. in this. It was equal on both sides of what went down. Yeah. Uh, um, but but can I also say the two things? First of all, he had like one of the worst lawyers I've ever seen. And secondly, I'm glad at least Marvel Disney just didn't throw him under the bus immediately. At least they waited to see the outcome because you know you saw it with Warner Brothers like as yeah. soon as like with the Johnny Depp situation as soon as like the allegations just came out they dropped him like a bad habit so at least Disney just like waited I guess if that's worth anything yeah I mean it, it, it's kind of sad I mean one person I heard talking about it, they were like why did they have to fire him you know it's a misdemeanor <laughs> you know I but again again you don't want in this state of you know, feminism and don't touch women, don't beat women. The Harvey Weinstein situation, 
everyone in Hollywood is very sensitive about men touching women in, inappropriately. Yeah, and, and, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, plus it's a family. These are family films, so you can't right. have, like you can't have that association with it, unfortunately. So you know that's why they had to fire him. It's like it's it like a quote um, one of the movie pundits said: it "Ain't show friends, it's show business." So yeah, it, it right, and it, it is unfortunately it is about business with them, and it's and it's kind of it's it's a shame when we have black men caught up in that hollywood ask situation mm -hmm. or in toxic relationship whatever it might be or they do something dumb where it hurts them instead of helping them yeah um and it's it's, it's sad but you know hopefully he'll land on his feet and move forward yeah um whatever that might be mm -hmm. so um it's an interesting day um, we got a little surprise. The world got a little surprise last night with <laughs> um, Colorado actually stood up and said Donald Trump can't be on their primary ballot. Yeah, I did not expect that. <laughs> I, I, I think everyone's kind of like shocked. There's one congressman who's trying to introduce a bill now to um, make sure that states use the 14th amendment correctly not something political and, and i'm like it's not political it's all he broke the law yeah. um, even though he may not have been convicted there's enough evidence out there that anyone can present to show what his actions were and they were not he was not upholding the constitution he was not up upholding his office of the presidency he was inciting stuff and he didn't do his job when people were attacking in the Capitol and he didn't call in support for the police officers who were trying to protect the Congress people in the Capitol at the time. But that being said, if those of you who have not heard, the um, a divided Colorado Supreme Court on Tuesday declared former President Donald Trump ineligible for the White House under the U.S. Constitution's insurrection clause within the 14th Amendment. And they removed him from the state's presidential, the Republican presidential primary ballot. But this has set up a showdown to the Supreme Court because Trump, obviously, his campaign is going to, he's going to appeal it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is already considering whether or not he's immune to all of these lawsuits because he claim, he keeps claiming presidential immunity. And there is no such thing because once you become once he leaves office, he's regular citizen again. He doesn't mm -hmm. want to accept that because in his mind, he th thinks like a dictator. Yeah. When in everybody else's mind, you are not. And I think he, as one political pundit said, they've never seen someone play victim politics so well as Donald Trump. And people are buying the crap. That's what irritates me the most. He's telling you what he's going to do when he gets in office. He's not going to do it for one day. You don't play dictator for one day. You play dictator mm -hmm. forever if you want. And I think of, you know, hopefully there are enough people to do the checks and balances, you hope. But yes, he, he still has to get there. Um, and unfortunately, the more that people ding him, the more his poll numbers go up through the roof. But those are poll numbers. They're not voters. Yeah, exactly. We have to see what happens at the ballot box because that quiet majority that we're not hearing from, that's that same quiet majority that was quiet when they voted in Obama. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's going to be interesting to see how the Democratic Party transforms the campaigns of all their representatives. Is it going to be democracy? Or Trump, I think they need to. I think they need to talk about democracy and governing, than concentrating on Trump. The more they toot Trump's horn or Trump the negativity, it plays against them. The more they talk about upholding patriotism, democracy, and the rule of law, and how they govern, they win, yeah. and that's what people want. So we just have to see what happens. Um, but it's going to be a showdown in January. January, you know, the Supreme Court has already asked for um, briefs 
Um, the, the court has stayed its decision until January 4th, and the issue must be settled by January 5th. So they can go ahead and print their primary ballots because Colorado's primary is soon. Mm. So they're they're on a deadline. So it's going to be interesting. The new year is going to, that first weekend of the new year is going to be jumping. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens. And I'm not talking blizzards nor nor Easter's or any other storm other than the, the legal and political storm that may occur after the new year. Mm -hmm. Also, in that same context of, of the election defamation, Rudy Giuliani, um, the man who was the the hero of nine of nine eleven, you know what? It's sort of sad to see your heroes get shot down when they do dumb stuff. And unfortunately, Rudy Giuliani, he is just he doesn't know how to say okay, I give up, I was wrong. He doesn't know how to say that. He just knows how to continue to lie because that's all he knows. A federal jury found Rudy Giuliani liable in the civil defamation case against um, Ruby Freeman, where he spoke out against Ruby Freeman and her daughter, Andrea Shea Moss. Um, they won $148.17 million in damages. Ooh, that's a lot of money. <laughs> and the plaintiffs have just sought, you know, a small $24 million. And they won. Julian is claiming that he wasn't allowed to present anything in discovery. Well, he never presented anything to, to beef up his argument that he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't participate <laughs> in the process. And because he didn't participate in the process, this is what you get. So he continues to claim that you know, these people did wrong and all this other stuff. So they have filed another lawsuit against him because he keeps lying against them. And the second lawsuit, if they win that, basically that will make Giuliani not speak because the judge will order him, don't say another word. But it is what it is. So congratulations to Miss um, Freeman and, and Shay. They're standing up for the for poll workers. They're standing up for people who um, believe in the system, believe in the voting process, and they should not have to suffer for believing in a constitutional right and process that we all believe in and 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 faithfully do every year. So, mm. last but not least. Well, no, two things I have left, which are very, very interesting. Um, one that was just announced either today or yesterday. Um, the White House has taken significant steps toward enhancing police accountability and rebuilding trust between the law enforcement and the communities. They are getting ready to establish the National Law Enforcement Accountability Database. It's the first ever federal database designed to track the official record of law enforcement officers' misconduct. So that means once it's up and up and running and you have all the data collected, those officers who were dismissed from one police department will now have to be checked against this database. And if they come up in this database, that means they may or may not be able to work again in, as a law enforcement officer. You know, now not everyone commits a crime, not everyone does something wrong, um, but it is because, you know, one police officer can be dismissed from one police department and just go to a smaller town and get a job and do the same thing over again. We've seen it here in Cincinnati several times when police officers have been dismissed and go to a smaller town and get a job. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how they run it when it gets up and running and the impact of this action will be. And last but not least, you know, John, what are we going to do about Uncle Clarence? <laughs> uh, any, I, uncle, I, any Uncle Ruckus? Well, <laughs> um, I, I, I can't say I can't call him Justice Thomas anymore. I just have to say Uncle Clarence mm. because he's like that bad relative that keeps popping up all the time, and he always comes to family dinner, and everyone gives him a wide berth because they know. 
all they have to do is let him come in, eat the food, listen to his crap for a minute, and then let him go. <laughs> this is pretty much what I've deemed Uncle Clarence to. You know, he he basically there has been um I love ProPublica. I just have to say this. I have admired what they do because ProPublica is a journalistic group that is that advocates for the rule of law, that advocates for the people, and they dig down, investigate, and get to the meat of any given situation. Their latest report, entitled A Delicate Matter, reveals that Thomas previously under scrutiny for failing to report gifts from prominent Republican donors raised concern about his financial strain on justices and advocated for removing a law prohibiting judges from receiving speaking and other fees. Because, you know, when you're a justice of a Supreme Court justice, you don't really get money for speaking mm. fees, things like that, because you can, that that's a sign of influence. Gotcha. And um, basically what this comes out to is way back when, when, Uncle Clarence first got started in the Supreme Court, he was deeply in debt. And he asked the court for a huge pay raise because he said, otherwise, I'm going to quit. And he basically wrote this memo to a couple of Republican supporters and said, I'm going to leave if I don't get this because I'm deeply in debt. Next thing you know, he's on trips to wherever and getting stuff taken care of for him. Nice. <laughs> and so um, Republicans are, I mean, I'm sorry, Democrats are calling for him to recuse himself and not even be part of the discussion regarding Donald Trump's potential immunity case. They also think that there would be a stricter ethics law for Supreme Court justices, for maybe judges altogether, because they're judging us on our behavior. So that means their behavior should be at a certain level. I'm not saying they're all going to be perfect, but they're just certain things you can't do. Yeah. You know, if you're offered a trip, pay for it. Even if you have to do it, you know, um, installment payments every month, at least you can sell that. He didn't even declare a lot of stuff that he received mm. that's coming out. And I think there needs at least I think people are really saying there needs to be transparency. Who is influencing our justices to make the decisions so they go one way or the other? And I think that's that all comes down to transparency and belief. Because the belief in the justice system, the belief in the balloting system, the belief in our governance is eroding because too much is happening. Because there's not enough checks and balances because we have one party ruling forever on certain things and they're not being checked and they can't check themselves. And even when they check themselves, they're divided. That is all the chocolate news that I have for today. All right. Well, thank you, Andrea. So let's move on to our special guest. Our special guest today is Antoinette Moore, wife, mother, business owner, and community volunteer. How's it going, Antoinette? It's going pretty good, John. How are you both doing today, John and Andrea? Oh, just fine. Thank you. Yeah, just yeah. fine. Thank you for coming on. And um, I guess um, the first thing I want to ask is, uh, can you introduce uh, a little bit more about yourself to our uh, audience? Yes, yes, I definitely can. So I'll give you a little bit of background. I have over 10 plus years in the social work field. I've been a chemical dependency counselor, case manager. And I'm currently a project manager, I've done um, groups and different things like that. I have a business with More Life Health and Wellness where I talk about stress management and giving healthy techniques on how to manage stress and talk about how it affects our body and different things like that. So that's just a little bit about me. Okay. So um, basically another question I want to ask is that you are a uh, business owner, correct? Yes. Yes. I have my own business. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about your business? Yes. What I do is I provide workshops and speaking engagements on managing stress, teaching people the healthy techniques on how to manage their stress um, I provide toolkits that include things like workbooks, journals, um, and provide workshops to companies because the number one 
cause um, of stress that people deal with is occupational stress. Like our jobs are taking us out. <laughs> so I'm trying to help employers help their employees not be so stressed out. Yeah, most definitely. I, I know like a really stressful time can be the holidays. So do you have uh, any tips on how to reduce your stress during the holidays? Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely. I just read this research article that was in posted in November in an APA, and it talked about nine in 10 adults say something causes them stress during the holiday season. And it, it, it interviewed about 2000 people and 89 percent of the people talked about the different stresses that they experience. And I was reading and I was like, money and family stood out the most. And I mean, John, thinking about the holidays, what are two big things that you deal with during the holiday season? Uh, let's see. Uh, obviously, money. Uh, <laughs> yes. Because you want to give uh, you want to give uh, gifts for your significant others, mm -hmm. uh, an extended family, and sometimes, and uh, we deal with inflation, girl. So yeah, yeah, so, the costs are rising, right? <laughs> yeah, the cost is rising, and also. Um, one time a year where you have to deal with family, some family yeah. you love, yes. some family you just um, you're glad you only see them once a uh, once a once a year. <laughs> no, I'm <bad>. right, right. <laughs> and and so thinking about those two things with money and family, you want to figure out how to manage the holiday season. And a lot of people say the holidays start maybe in December. The holidays actually start in November. And if you're a super planner like me. You're probably going to start in October because you want to get a heads up on the holiday season that's coming. So some positive things I tell people to do is one, you want to make a plan. Thinking about the upcoming holiday season, you want to figure out what are you doing for the first holiday, which is Thanksgiving. Are you cooking or are you hosting, right? Mm -hmm. so you can make a plan. You can set a budget. That'll help you not to spend too much money thinking about this inflation that just happened for Thanksgiving. I think think turkeys cost maybe I didn't buy a turkey this year I, um I I I went out for uh Thanksgiving <laughs> so mm -hmm. I have to deal with that well I mean, I mean the, even the restaurants cost the price the prices are raising at restaurants too oh yeah I mean I mean if you're gonna buy an average turkey thing about if you're getting what a good 12 to 15 pound bird mm -hmm. I think it's over 20 dollars and I'm being kind when I say 20 yeah it might be yeah. even 30. Um, yeah. I know this year, my sister, because of costs, we're doing Cornish hens uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and, we're, and, and, we, and we, we've added two people to the dinner. So she's going to make sure that we, she's bought enough Cornish hens for, uh -huh. um, you know, because two come in a pack so we can get everybody covered with three, three sets, three or four yep, sets. And, and that that's exactly right. So you can, you can make a plan, you can set a budget. And then thinking about family dinners, Christmas is like right after Thanksgiving. Um, some people celebrate Hanukkah. Um, and there's just meals. Like every day people are talking about, oh, I'm going to have a friend's miss. Or, oh, I'm going to get my cousins together. And we're going to do this. And we're going to do that. And it's all of these activities and events that people have. And it's like, you've got to set a budget if you want to stay on top. I go crazy and out of control buying gifts for people every year. I always volunteer. <laughs> um, I buy my kids gifts and I say, I'm going to stick to a number. Like this year I said I was going to do um, somewhere around $500. I can tell you now, I probably <laughs> went over that because Amazon started to send me emails and then there's discounts. So I think setting a budget definitely helps with the holidays because you can stick to it. You won't feel overwhelmed on what you need to buy, who you need to buy things for, um, if you're cooking meals, um, you'll know how to delegate those meals. Kind of like you were speaking to Andrea, you said your sister does the Cornish hands. That's a smart tactic um, is having people bring dishes and identify what you want to do ahead of time. Well, and I mean, it, I was in the store today and uh -huh. I was watching the people going through the toy section and <laughs> it, it, it was, ooh, it, gets it, hectic. it gets very hectic. In fact, there was one couple, I was laughing at them. Because they were, they picked out one gift and they were talking about, oh, they're gonna, these kids are going to be spoiled. They're doing this. And they were really just picked out from one kid. And the uh -huh. wife was like, okay, we have two more kids to pay, to buy for. Don't just concentrate on this one kid, but this yeah. is the spoiled kid, not the uh -huh. other ones. And I was like, oh, but wow. you know, that, yeah. 
I saw that anxiety, but then the kids were going, mom, look at this, mom. You know, it was just, I see the stress for the parents. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's just, it's a whole new world, so. It definitely is. And I think the younger kids get, because they have technology, they can look things up. This Target circulator comes to my house and my daughter's like, I want this and I want that. And then I threw it away because I was like, this is just out of control. And she goes, mommy, did you get all the things I circled in that magazine? And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, how about just believing in Santa Claus and believing in a list or something like that? She's like, no, you and my dad and Nana and Papa are going to buy me gifts. And I'm like, man, Santa Claus needs to come back because Santa Claus only gets you one gift. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, so I, I completely understand it. It's it can get overwhelming with buying gifts and things like that. So sticking to a budget is definitely helpful. Identifying what you want to do, how much you want to spend per person or individual is always good too. Um, and the third thing that I, I really encourage people to do is set boundaries, especially when it comes to your family, friends, loved ones. Um, if we're talking about work and coworkers, through the holidays, I think a lot of people that you um, go around, you either spend too much time with them, you might drink too much, you start talking and conversations get too deep, and then you come out feeling like, oh, that was heavy, I did not want to be there, or I drank a little bit too much, or I stayed too long. Um, you can always learn to say no, and I think I think that's a big thing in the holiday season is if you don't want to be around that person that you feel is toxic or you have that cousin or family member, John, that we were talking about earlier when we mentioned family. <laughs> we all have that one cousin, right? Yeah, we do. Um, <laughs> learning how to set boundaries. People start asking you questions and they say, so how's work or how's that relationship? And then, you know, you can shut them down or say it's good and just leave it at that when they keep asking questions. The good thing for me is I'm married, but... Um, before then, people start asking me questions and I'm like, why Why are we focused on me here? Let's change the conversation <laughs> to something else or somebody else. <laughs> so. and, and, and someone who doesn't have a husband or children, I uh -huh. understand that conversation because it's like, first it was um, when my mother was alive, it was like, so when are you going to give her grandchildren? Uh -huh. And then I was always <laughs> like, when I find a husband and uh -huh. you know that hasn't happened, well, when are you going to start dating him? I've been dating hasn't just haven't found the right one yet so i mean it's it's interesting how things evolve and um you know this is going to be the fourth christmas without my mother uh -huh. um uh -huh. so, you know and so it's a little difficult for this year for my sister um what do you recommend for those individuals who have suffered loss this year what do you recommend for them to help through their process I definitely tell people to create a wellness space for themselves. So I lost my mom in 2019 and around the holidays, one of my plans that I do is try to bring back her memories. So one of the things she loved to do was bake. So I would try to bake her favorite dish, play some music that she likes. And my mom liked to watch holiday cartoons. <laughs> so I definitely turn on the old school holiday cartoons. And that for me creates that, that safe space, that wellness where I might call my sisters and we talk about some memories and things like that. So that brings warmth for me. And I tell people, if you're experiencing loss or you're in isolation is develop a wellness plan try to identify a safe person that you can spend time with. So you're not isolated when you're starting to feel down or emotional, you know, that accountability partner that you can talk to, to get out of that that space and then make a plan. If you're a person that's kind of isolated on Christmas or you don't have family, try to find a friend that you can go visit or spend some time with or plan to get out and go to the movies. I know the color purple's coming out. Ooh, um, so you so can make a plan, yeah. Just just real quick, I saw, uh -huh. saw an advanced screen of the color purple. So okay. good. So, so good. I would definitely recommend seeing that on Christmas day. If you haven't oh, gotten yeah. your tickets yet, go get them. Movies, fantastic. It's our, it's definitely, it's shot to the number one on my top 10 list of the year. It's so good. I, I, I just, I just had to say that I'm not paid by Warner Brothers to say that. I just, I just had to say that the movie is so good. Go on, Antoinette. No, no, you're fine. That movie's good. It's deep. It's about family connections, relationships. I mean, you might find something new about yourself looking at the movie <laughs> and get, you know, a thought or something like that. But yeah, make make a plan to do something like that. Hang out with people. I tell people don't shop too much, but if you just need to feel like you're need you're needing to get out of the house to do something different, you know, find a restaurant that's open and go get a cup of tea, coffee. I don't 
encourage ca- caffeine too much, but it's <laughs> it's not isolating yourself and being around other people. And if you're a person that experiences seasonal depression and you need, you know, behavioral health or mental health supports or talk to a therapist, um, counseling, treatment or whatever you need, make appointments around the holiday schedule that's available for you. There's crisis numbers out there if you need to contact them plan to have a friend call you and say, hey, text me on this day at this time. If you know in advance, that's the important day or the time. So those are just some tips um, that I believe can help us through the holidays, making a plan, setting a budget, creating boundaries, having that that wellness or um, plan to help you if you're struggling or if you're somebody like me, like Andrea, you mentioned you lost your mom. It's been about five years since my mom passed and I just always try to find something to bring back that memory of her so I can smile instead of, you know, trying to isolate or get upset. Well, I mean, for my, in fact, it's been a topic of discussion with my sister and I this year. And we both, my mother made Christmas so special. She loved Christmas. She had Christmas toys, stuffed animals, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I made it a point that I have, the tree up. I have the stuffed animals out. I have the little knickknacks out. And the only thing that I have not really done is I have not played our Christmas music collection that I have, the CDs, because those are the CDs I played for her when she was in her nursing home facility. I haven't been able to do that part yet, but I have played Christmas music in different ways. But Uh we, but I, I, I sit in the living room and look at my Christmas tree. And it's not Christmas without the Christmas tree. And yeah. that that is my sister and I, we both agree, you know, white Christmas tree with bulbs, uh, plenty of lights. And, you know, that atmosphere has helped us to bring mom back into Christmas, even though we're both are going to be with my father this year. And, uh-huh. and, you know, because before it was mom was Christmas, he was New Year's. So now we get to have both with him. And okay. my parents, my parents were divorced. So that's another drama. Woo. Divorce no, I understand. Yep. Yep. But I, completely- I mean, it's, it's, you know, basically it's, it's, even if you get over that huge wage of grief, you still have moments. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think this year we're going to make my favorite, des- my mother's favorite dessert was the cheesecake and it's mm-hmm. her cheesecake recipe. Uh-huh. And she didn't write it down. The only thing she wrote down were the ingredients. So we're going to figure this thing out, but we're going to make cheesecakes for the dinner this year. Okay. So, so that is, but you know, it, it, it can be rough for some people um, who feel that desperation. They, uh-huh. you know, it, it's, there's people who don't have a lot. Christmas yeah. is going to come. Christmas is going to go. Um, uh-huh. I used to work on Christmas when I was a reporter and I put it down to, okay, it's just a day. And then I got to enjoy it, but it was, it was a working day. So, Uh um, but I know how, I mean, this whole season can be very, very rough for people. Um, It definitely can. And I tell people to focus on the three C's of grief during that time. You know, if they find themselves struggling, you can choose, choose what's best for you. Not what somebody tells you to do. You know, everybody handles grief differently. You can connect, like you said, you connect with your sister and then you can communicate, talk about your emotions, talk about what you're feeling. And I think through that process, when you individualize it, once you get to the other side, it may help you to feel a little bit lighter. I definitely processed that. I did that last weekend with my sisters when we had our sister day, we watched a holiday movie and we were laughing so much tears was coming down our eyes. And we was like, remember mommy used to do X, Y, and Z. And all of our sisters just busted out laughing. And I was just like, man, afterwards, like today, that felt good. Oh yeah. So th- we're going to do, we're actually, we're going to be doing that while we're, my sister and I, we're cooking Christmas dinner mm-hmm. for our family. So it's going to be, it's going to be fun. Cause you know, we both rule our kitchens and mom ruled her kitchen. <laughs> Okay. And my father, you know, my father rules his kitchen. Like last year for Christmas dinner, my sister's elevator broke in her apartment building. And we ended up having to carry Christmas dinner to my father's house down six flights of stairs. Uh. Yeah, we don't want to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, find what's funny out of the stress. Yeah. Um, that's what I hear you saying. Uh-huh. And connect, communicate. And then enjoy. That's what I hear you saying the most. Enjoy. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I think 
I think one of the things for me, the holidays are about togetherness and I always have somebody that I'm with during the holidays. So I don't isolate myself, even though I have a family that I live with. Sometimes I wake up feeling lonely because I just miss my mom or I miss those times that we used to share. And I'm like, I technically pick up my phone thinking I'm going to call everybody. And sometimes I try to dial my mother's number and I'm just like, wait, I can't call her anymore. So it's like, you know, it's trying to feel like, okay, what am I going to do next? You know, having that plan in place so that you can step into something different so you don't get isolated. I think it's the biggest thing. Oh, yeah. And I would just say, you know, the best, I would say, Marina, my sister, again, we were doing a memory swap. And the best Christmas memory we had is when Michael Jackson unveiled Thriller, Christmas <laughs> Eve night. I was pressing, I was supposed to be pressing the tablecloth to set the dinner table. Maria was chopping up something and mom was in the kitchen. And next thing you know, we all stopped to watch Thriller. And we were freaking out because we're like, did you just see what that was? You know, why is, why is Halloween at Christmas Eve? So, but it, 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 I mean, just remember the good times. And Oh, yeah. Definitely. And I, I think about my last Christmas with my mom, I was pregnant with my youngest daughter and my mom gave me a gift of gingerbread cookies, my favorite cookies of all time. She gave me stuffed peanut butter pretzels. And then she Ooh. gave me this picture frame that said, life is an adventure. And I cherish those last gifts that she gave me. And I had that picture frame hanging up because life is an adventure. I'm like, wow, that was the best gift that I ever got cookies oh. snacks <laughs> okay the stuffed peanut butter pretzels sound wonderful yeah and you know my sister and I we both remember my mother because she had um a plaque in the kitchen mm -hmm. and my sister now owns it, it it's of the 13th commandment mm -hmm. it's thou shall not be a smart ass uh. <laughs> that that's a good one that yes. And, and, and everyone, you know, and I always start that out and I always tell people, my mother had the 13th commandment. They're like, there is no 13th commandment. I'm like, oh yes, there is. So, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I would just say, but well, one more question I have, what do you suggest for people who encounter um, those who are homeless or those living in a shelter, but trying to do good like, you know, mm -hmm. out food. what do you recommend? How can we have be, help them to be uplifting when they're in a difficult situation? I think the biggest thing is providing resources. Um, it's funny you asked this question. One of the things I'm going to do with my daughters to teach them about, you know, real life and to humble them is we're actually going to make um, gift bags and we're going to go downtown to Washington Park and pa pass them out. It may be like some warm socks, maybe $5 in a Ziploc bag and a positive quote and some resources for Christmas. There are shelters and places that are open on Christmas that provide warm meals to individuals. So if you know someone that's not connected to anyone, they can reach out um, to the local places that are providing holiday meals and dinners. A lot of things are posted on websites you can call. I think it's 411. I'm from Cleveland originally, so I say 21. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can contact the United Way or go on their website to see what's open and what's available um, on Christmas Day around the holiday season. I know there's normally um, churches, Catholic churches that do meals on Christmas Day. Um, the food bank passes out boxes. There's a lot of churches doing drives and donations where people can um, pick up things and get a warm meal. Or you can just pass out, you know, a gift card or some cash to somebody just so that they can go somewhere and pick up things that they need. It's just spreading a love to one another. Okay. All right, John. Thanks, Andrea. And uh, Antoinette, those were, those were some um, very helpful tips to help uh, manage stress in the holidays. God knows people get stressed during the holiday season. So thanks for those uh, tips. Greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome. And it's just, you know, making a plan, setting a budget and setting boundaries. Those are the three main things through the holidays. All right. Well, that's it for today's show. Um, and I want to th also thank Andrea for all the chocolate news. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. I, was, it, it, I had fun. And uh, remember, folks, um, Christmas is on uh, Monday, so we will be taking our little uh, Christmas break. But uh, we'll make sure we're back for the new year for you guys. 
Uh, and you can find more information about today's topics and past podcast episodes at www.thecincinnatiherald.com, the Sesh newsletter, or on our social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Threads. And make sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. Our podcast is on Apple, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, Amazon, YouTube, and Google Podcasts. In addition, the Cincinnati Herald is now accepting applications for an advertising representative. So please call or text our publisher, Walter White, at 513-680-7076 for more information. I'm John Alexander Reese. And I'm Andrea Carter. And have a good day and have a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. 